wanted to talk to you tonight a little bit about one of the more perplexing questions about Christianity, and, and that, is, that is the fact that God is not um, short on, on promises. In fact, there, there are many, many promises in Scripture, some very, very lavish, some comforting, some even frightening, to be quite honest. But God promises many things. We're promised in Scripture that, that we all have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? We belong to him. We, we are his. We, we are actually his, his possession. We are told in Ephesians 1.19 that there is incredibly great power for all of us who believe. Incredibly great power available to us. Um, we, are, we are told um, more, more on that. Here is, here's one to get your head around. You believe, and we're going to be celebrating this very shortly, aren't we? We're going to talk about Good Friday, about the death of Christ. We're going to talk on Easter Sunday about the resurrection of Christ. And there is a thing in the church calendar also called Ascension Sunday. And that is that time where we think about the fact that Christ ascended, is now seated at the right hand of God. Now, that's that's one thing to get your hand to head around. But what about this? Ephesians 2, 6, you and I have been raised up with Jesus Christ. And there is a sense in which we too are seated with him in the heavenly realm. Can you get your head around that? What an incredible promise. Um, Ephesians 3, 16, Paul is praying that we will be strengthened with power in our in our inner being by his spirit so that Christ may truly dwell in our hearts. The spirit of God dwells within us and there is power for the inner life. These are all promises regarding our being, who it is that we have been called to be. But there are just as many promises regarding, well, that aspect of our Christian walk in which we are perhaps called to do. We're told to go make disciples, for instance, and, and to do so because all authority and power has been given to Jesus Christ. We're being told that, again, on the basis that we will receive power, that we are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Again, these are incredible promises, promises to be, promises to do. And I don't know about you, but you might struggle from time to time to believe that what God has promised is actually your experience. What about even a very, very simple one? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. The presence of God with you in every experience. How much of that is your experience? And this is, as I say, one of the rather perplexing aspects of the Christian life. We have this multitude of promises to lay hold of, but the truth is that sometimes there seems to be a huge gap or, or even an obstacle, an insurmountable obstacle standing in our way to claim these promises as it were. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. God gives us many promises, some lavish, some comforting, some frightening, many, many promises in Scripture. Why are these not always a part of our everyday experience? Where's the problem lie? Is it with us? Is it with God? Why is he just, it seems, a little bit not forthcoming with the answers to these solutions? So let's have a look at that, shall we? In uh, Joshua, um, we've, been, we've been having a look at this, this incredible journey that the people of Israel have been on. And it really, really has been quite something. And we got to that part where the Israelites understood that no longer could they remain in that, that sort of desolate space that they had been wandering around for some 40 years. No, there was, there was no future for them here. They, they had to cross over the Jordan River, and they had to enter into this land of great promise that the Lord had given them. Um, in chapter 2, verse 24, here is the promise summarized, and this is in the words of the, 
the Israelite nation themselves. They said to Joshua, look, chapter 2, verse 24, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. And all the people are melting in fear because of us. So here were the people of Israel, and they were looking at the promised land, all this area out to the west. But then in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, But early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from the Acacia Grove, and, and they went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. Now, they were there for three days. So... Here is, the, here is the picture, and I want to, if you are having trouble picturing this, and by the way, I, under, I understand um, some amazing things are going to happen very, very shortly in this particular passage to do with the Jordan River, and you're going to have trouble understanding it. So I have brought to you the Jordan River. This looks like just a blue piece of material. This is not. This is water. And if all goes well, oh, look at this. It's working. It's working. If all goes well, we can just bring out the Jordan River here. And here she is, wide and strong. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, 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 there's a rock. And it flows over the rock and, and around the rock sometimes. And so, so here is so the nation of Israel. Here they all are in, in sort of this, this no man's land. And they understand that their future is over here. But they have to cross the Jordan River. Now, God in his providence, I mean, time belongs to God. God in his providence could easily have, have sort of led them to this place during the dry season. But no, we read that the Jordan River at this particular time is in flood. It's impossible to cross. When they get to this point, and there they are camped, remember, for three days they're camped, and they're looking at the river in flood. And it would have been impossible for them to not have just started to think about the losses. If we try and take our cattle and our herds and our sheep and our little lambs, I mean, how many lambs can you, can you carry at a given time in this pocket? I mean, you can only carry so many lambs, right? There's going to be losses. They're going to lose some sheep. They're going to lose some cattle and women, children, families. What if somebody slips? I mean, this is dangerous stuff. God's promises are over there. We're over here. And here is this insurmountable obstacle in between. They must have felt that this was some cruel kind of a trick. But it seems very common amongst God's people to have this experience, to be, to be given a promise from God, a, a promise that... He's, he's going to do something special in your life. Have you ever had that sense? You've been, been told for years that, that you are precious to God, you are special to him. You know that. You've heard that he's your heavenly father. You've, you've heard that you're the apple of his eye. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you, and all that is absolutely true. You are special to God. And so... There's nothing wrong with feeling that in some way or another, he is going to do something special in your life. He is going to do something special with your life. We should believe that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has, God has promised that in some way or another, he is, going to, he is going to do something very, very special in you? That for all of eternity, he is going to be to the praise of his glory, talking about that wonderful work that he did in and through your life. Absolutely. I hope you believe that. And you might feel like, oh, but I'm not called to be a Billy Graham. No, you're not. Only Billy Graham was. That's all. And, and you know, that's it. But you're called to be you. You're a child of God. God wants to do something wonderful in you. He wants to do something wonderful through you. He will give you promises to that. Scripture is filled with them. There are wonderful, wonderful promises about your life that God wants to fulfill. But you come across these insurmountable obstacles. A sin which is, is just too difficult to handle. It just, there's such defeat in that. Um, 
bitterness that seems to have taken a, a deep root in your life, disappointment that leaves you despondent, ever believing that God could really come through for you, confusion about the ways of God, about how he has worked in your life or, or about the, the future possibilities. Maybe you're dreaming of this, but it seems hopeless. No, the obstacles that are in our way are often, yes, humanly speaking, insurmountable. And they seem to stand in the way of, of all that God has called us to. I remember Bron and I, um, as we left Bible college, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, we headed up north to do a great job for God. We felt very much a, a call, a sense of guidance leading as we headed up to, to Queensland, inland, not a particularly amazing place, a, a little country town, a church that nobody had heard of in a suburb that nobody had heard of. Those living in the suburbs, some of them had heard of it. But it wasn't anything spectacular. There would be nobody writing books on, on this particular ministry. It was, no, 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 no. It was, but Bron and I, in our heart of hearts, we really wanted to do something wonderful for God. And uh, I remember on one occasion, not long after we were there, um, coming to understand how deep the divide within the church was between the two services, sort of, sort of rather traditional service and then the more contemporary service. Between the two services, um, I, I went out to the to the toilet block out the back, and, and it was right at the back of the church hall. And as I went out to the toilet block, as, as I went in, I heard this sniffling. And I remember, remember thinking, this isn't sort of the sniffling like I've got a, I got a cold. <laughs> this was the sort of sniffling like somebody would have been weeping, seriously. And as I went in, there was the senior pastor. And he's just bracing himself against a wall, just crying, and he was just... He suddenly realized somebody had come in and he felt embarrassed and he sort of I said, I'm all right, I'm all right. And he, and he rubbed his eyes. I said, he's all right. And he said, ah, usual, somebody said something again. And he, he went out and I remember just thinking to myself, whoa, I don't know who has said it or what they have said, but this obviously hit deep. This one hurt. This really hurt. I thought, how could God's people do that? God, we came here from Melbourne to, to do something great for you, but this is impossible. When a church is divided that deeply, when there's that much hurt and that much pain, how is this ever going to happen? We, we can't do this. Only you can. It was, it was an insurmountable obstacle, without a doubt. And God, indeed, said to us, you're right. You can't do this. Only I can. But if I do it, who will get the glory? You see, life's challenges, these obstacles to personal growth, these obstacles to, to ministry growth, these obstacles even to us as a church community, these obstacles and challenges serve as opportunities for for God's glory to, to shine through. It's an invitation for us to, to seek God in a way we otherwise never would and to watch and to see him at work. And this is actually what we see with the, with the Israelites here. There are some beautiful, beautiful promises here. Chapter 3, for instance, in, in verse 3, the officers went throughout the camp and they're giving orders to the people. And they say this, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you were to move out from your positions and you were to follow it. Isn't God precious? He's basically, basically saying, just, just watch me. Keep your eyes fixed on me. When you see the priests and they lift up the Ark, you'll know it's time. And so there's this invitation to us to, when we find these obstacles and challenges into life, to look to God. As we look to God, we will notice that he is at work in some way. And then we know, okay, we follow him. 
God is on the move. Get ready to follow. Everybody, get ready. And, and we ourselves can ready us or ready ourselves um, in order to, to follow God, to look to see when it, where he is at work and to follow him. In verse 4, then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. I love the compassion in that. God knows you haven't been this way before. And filled with compassion, he says, it's okay. You just look to me. You'll see me at work and you'll know to get ready because I know you haven't been this way before. The truth is that for most of us, when we to lay claim of God's promises, we haven't faced challenges like this before. We haven't faced these sorts of obstacles. That's never happened in our experience. God is filled with compassion. I know that. You haven't been this way before. That's all right. Just watch me. I will go before you. You just follow. I've got this, I've got this covered. We had a wonderful sense of this. Actually, as we were driving up to this church in Queensland, again, filled with expectation, we had this wonderful, we believe, sign from God. We're, we're driving along the highway, just blue skies, it's getting more and more fun. We're leaving drizzly old Melbourne behind us, and we're heading up north. And, and so there we are in the car with the trailer, the family. We're all there, uh, probably Veggie Tales or Colin Buchanan playing, keeping the kids amused. And Bron and I, as we approach Brisbane, we look up into this blue sky. And it took no imagination whatsoever there in the clouds, the cloud was forming a dove. And, uh, and I can't remember which of us noticed it first, but it said, do you see that cloud? And we're looking at the, it's like a, it's like a perfect dove. It's like, wow. And then I'm, this is before GPS, so we couldn't, couldn't really kind of work it out. But I'm thinking, I reckon that is, that is over near Brisbane where we're heading. And uh, sure enough, wherever we, wherever we turned, this dove cloud was right in front of us the whole way. Now, you can come up with many explanations for it. It doesn't really matter. For us, we felt very, very clearly it was just another sign from God. This is the way. I know you haven't been this way before, but follow me. Follow me. I'm going to get you to where you need to be. And likewise, the nation of Israel simply had to watch when the, when the priests lift up the ark, get ready, I'm at work. I know you haven't been this way, but that's all right. Follow me. I will, I will take you. I will get you to where you need to be. And then in verse 8, it's all happening. They're ready to cross. God is at work. Verse 8, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. And verse 11, see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Well, this, if you think about the Ark of the Covenant, there's, it was known as the throne of God. The throne of God. It would be placed in the Holy of Holies, in, in the house of God, as it were. Um, inside were the tablets, which, of course, were, were God's law. And, and what, what did the law represent? His character, the holiness of God. And it was always associated with the presence of God. So you have the priests lifting up the symbol of God's presence, God's holiness, and God, because it's his throne, his rule and dominion. So here is God's presence, God's holy character, and his rule, his dominion, going ahead of the people of Israel, right into the center of their biggest challenge. Right into the middle of the obstacle, the thing that lay between where they were and where they needed to be. The thing that stood between them laying hold of God's promises, the very presence of God with all of his rule and his holy character being symbolized in that Ark of the Covenant, there it was right in the middle. And so then 
We're told the most amazing thing happens. As the priests step into the water, the water dries up. Actually, not right there on the spot, but, but, but some, some miles up the river um, at, a, at a town by the name of Adam or Adam, or actually by the time the, wild, the water all piled up there, it was Adam. And so, or Adam. Anyway, something like this for those who, who like the visual. So basically the water was just piling up this way. I do like that. I think it worked. This morning we had a few technical issues. But there, but there it is. And the water just dried up allowing the Israelites to, to cross over on, on dry land. The very presence and character and rule, the holy character of God, entered into their challenge, the obstacle, the thing that stood between them and their promises. And the whole nation got to see this wonderful thing. The ark essentially represents the glory of God. And the glory of God entered right into the middle of their biggest obstacle and provided a way. Here was God leading them through it. They might have stood there on the water and said, there's got to be a way around this. There's got to be a way under it. Maybe we should build a bridge and get over it. They must have thought about many different possibilities, but God, no. I want to lead you through this particular situation. In fact, follow me. I'm going to take you through. And that's exactly what God does. When we got to this this church and after this incident and many more like it, unfortunately, I remember thinking, wow, we, we came to do a great work for God. It seems that we're not going to be able to do that. It's impossible. Unless God intervenes, nothing here is going to happen. And so I I started to spend a lot more time on on my face and on the phone. On the phone to my mentor who kind of kept me standing firm and kept my hand to the plow. Stay there, Stuart. I believe God really wants you to be there. And I needed to hear that as a young man who just wanted to turn and go the other way. Just to throw his hands up and say, you know what? This is impossible. What sort of a dysfunctional church is this? It's impossible to pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm heading back to Melbourne. And Brad will tell you many times I actually thought about packing up the car and just calling it quits. This is too tough. And my mentor, a very godly man by the name of Alan Gordon, would just talk me, talk me off the bridge, as it were, on the phone. And he would just, you know, stay the course, Stuart, stay the course. And then I spent a lot of time on my face as, as well, just crying to God, what do I do? What do I do? This is impossible. When a church is this hurt and this wounded, is there any, any possibility of, of recovery? And again, God would just seem to show us and say in so many different ways that, Stuart, you need to see that this so-called obstacle, this challenge, is actually an opportunity for my glory to shine through. My glory is going to shine through this this obstacle, this challenge. I will be seen for who I really am through it. No more was this evident, perhaps, than as we were finishing up there. Um, Finally, finally we felt that our particular time in ministry was coming to an end. And and God had done amazing things. Um, He'd... The young adults group was non-existent, and now it had a, a strong group of you know thirty young adults meeting you know during the midweek, and you couldn't keep them away. The youth ministry had been oh, it looked like it was going to die off at one point, and now it was strong, and vital, and a God was transforming lives. Some amazing things were happening. People were coming to the Lord, and a schools ministry had started. We were kind of finishing up, and, and it was one of the last nights that, that the young adults were meeting. And, and it was kind of special to me, I guess, because God, had, in the midst of all of this, and truly you could say, only God could have done it, because we couldn't. But in the midst of all of this, there was much to celebrate, and, 
And this was one of the last nights I had to talk to them. So mid-afternoon, I remember sitting down with a blank sheet of paper, but, but with only about five minutes to go until the meeting that night, I still had a blank sheet of paper. I had prayed and agonized and thought about all sorts of things that afternoon, and nothing made sense. Rarely have I had a time like that, except that, God, I don't know what is going on here, but I've put the time aside for this one last amazing hoorah talk from Stuart. And I've got nothing. What do I do? This is so embarrassing. I just felt this nudge. Stuart, it's time to go. Trust me. I grabbed my Bible and I headed over to the hall. We lived in a manse next door and I headed over to the hall and up the stairs. And there was such this sense of God's presence. It was It was amazing, and and they were all gathered in such a sense of anticipation. I mean, they really knew that this was the time we meet with God. And uh, and Neil was leading the worship, and he was there with his guitar, and he he had two songs picked out, and I I still didn't have anything to say. So I asked him, hey, mate, do do you think you've got another song in you? And he said, oh, you want three? Really? I said, yeah, 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 three would be good, three would be good. He said, all right, all right, we'll do that. So he did song number one, and I'm there, please, Lord. Please, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? Song number two, please, Lord, that's two down, one to go. We get to song number three, still got nothing. So Neil's just about to finish up, and I look over at him, and then with a somber, slightly prophetic look, just said, hey, just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he says, oh, okay. So he plays through song number three again, and, and he's, he's getting to the end. I still got nothing. So I thought, I think I can get away with this one more time. I get a look at her. <laughs> Didn't make eye contact, and so he's got no choice. Huh? All right. So he sings, sings, sings it through again. He gets to the end of this one. I've still got nothing. And he just finishes with a hard note. Dung. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, that's it. I'm not going anymore. <laughs> I said, all right, Lord, you've got to come through. I said, let's all pray. Let's bow our heads. Still buying time. And then I get the one word which just oh, sends a jolt of fear through every pastor. It was two words, actually. Foot washing. I said, oh, no, Lord, not that. No, it's something else, isn't it? That's not it. That's not what you're saying. You're saying something else, aren't you? Hand washing, maybe. Hand washing. When would you all wash our hands last? And I thought, no, it's foot washing, isn't it? Oh, Lord, it's so complicated. You're going to get basins of water. Where are we going to get the soap? And every question I had, you know, it was, was met with an answer. Towels? Oh, we do have some towels actually downstairs. Soap? Was, oh, we do have some soap downstairs. Basins of water, Lord. Where are we going to get that? And then I suddenly thought of the baptistry. We were having a baptism that Sunday, and it was open. Now, this was, you don't understand, this baptistry was only just shy of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It was massive. It was built back in the days of the old revivals. They were expecting big things. And, uh, and so that happened to be open. And I sort of thought, well, I guess we could all just sit around the baptistry. About 200 people could sit around the baptistry. We could sit around the baptistry and do it. And so oh, maybe this is of you. But Lord, what about, what about women who have come with stockings and that? That's just embarrassing and awkward. And, and I just felt, Stuart, this is... Just obedience. Do it. So I said, well, guys, <clears throat> I'd like you to meet me in the hall next door. I've got something a bit special tonight. They believed me. And so they all kind of headed out the hall and downstairs into the church next door, and I headed over to and I said, hey, leaders, can I just see you for a moment? Quick, go get some towels. Go get some soap. Meet me over there. Please, help. And so we met over there, and I thought, seriously, God, is this... This is what you want. And then, and then God showed up in the most amazing way. I, seriously, I didn't know what I was doing. I opened, opened up the book, the Gospel of John. I started to read about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And I was very moved as I, as I read it and the servant heart. And, and I knew what to do next. I need to wash the leader's feet. And so I just started washing their feet. And I thought, then they're going to wash the feet of everybody else. And I got halfway through the first foot, particularly ugly, hairy one, to be quite honest. But I saw past that, and I just, I was so moved 
by this, actually, I just started crying. As I had the privilege of just serving with these guys and watching God at work in their midst over the last couple of years. And now this was it, but I had the opportunity, just as Jesus did with the disciples, now to wash their feet, to say thank you and to serve them and now to set an example for them as they would now serve the others. And I washed washed the leader's feet and then just stood back and then they jumped in the baptistry and they just started washing everyone else's feet. And they too were really, really moved and, and touched. It was a very, very special time. And it was only what it was because the glory of God, we had invited it and the glory of God had entered into that dysfunctional, divided church situation in such a way that the rule of God and the holiness of God and the presence of God had manifested itself in this remarkable way. And all our lives were changed and we would never be the same because of it. You see, God loves to take obstacles and life's challenges in order for his glory to shine through. And it might be a personal challenge. It might be a ministry challenge. It might be a corporate challenge that we face as a church. A challenge to be or a challenge to do. But whatever that challenge is, whatever the obstacle is, the glory of God can transform that as God walks right into the middle of your greatest challenge bringing his glory, his power, his authority, his rule, and his wonderful comfort and and presence, his righteous character and his holiness. Your Jordan River, whatever that might be, is an opportunity for God's glory to shine through. And he loves us to come to a place where in in the midst of our challenges and in the midst of our obstacles, we come to a place where we now embrace it. We're not looking for a way around it. We're not looking for an escape route. But we're simply saying to God, God, if this is it, then I surrender. Whatever will bring you the greatest glory, let it be. Let it be. Let me see you at work. Please lead me, walk ahead of me, walk into my challenge. Show your rule, your power, your righteousness. Let it be manifest. And take me through to the land of promise, to lay hold of all that you have have promised me. And this is exactly what happens with the people of Israel. In chapter 4, verse verse 24, the summary of this whole incident in crossing the Jericho, we read, He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. You see, when God brings you through, the whole world will know that he is with you. We read, Previously in chapter 3, verse 7, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Again, when God brings you through, others will know that God is with you. In verse 10, We read, this is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the peoples of this land. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. When God brings you through, you will know that God is with you. You will know his presence in a way you have never known it before. And that's why. As perplexing as it is, when the promises of God seem so far away and insurmountable obstacles are in our way, that's why we understand that God is inviting us 
to face those challenges, to face those obstacles, and to look for him to lead us through, right through the middle of them, in such a way that we will know that he is present and we will see his glory shine through. And I guess tonight, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, there is a particular aspect of this that that we should consider, and, and that's this. Jesus, whose name is the same as Joshua, the Lord saves, the second Joshua, as he's sometimes referred to, he stands at the Jordan River. We read that John the Baptist was was in the river, and and Jesus said, I want you to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, who am I to baptize you? But Jesus, standing at the Jordan River, nonetheless steps into it to allow himself to be baptized. Now, what's he doing here? This is the start of his public ministry. And, of course, in the Jewish mind, baptism was very much about being cleansed. But Jesus knows. that there is no cleansing sufficient for all the peoples of the earth, every generation, every tribe and tongue. There is no cleansing sufficient, no river big enough for that type of challenge. No, it would take a perfect sacrifice. So Jesus symbolizes his whole ministry in this way. He allows himself to be, as it were, buried in the waters, to be crucified, for he will take the sin of the world upon himself. And then he he is raised up out of the waters because he will enable all those who believe in him to experience new eternal life. His whole ministry symboled in this one, symbolized in this one act. His death and burial in place of yours and mine. His being raised to a new life, an invitation for us to experience that, that new life as well. And so Jesus enters into the Jordan. He's baptized, as it were, symbolically buried and raised to new life. He's baptized. And then what happens? Heaven is ripped open. And his heavenly father says, oh, my son, I'm so pleased with you. In John 17, Jesus then says, heavenly father, would you, would you now allow me to be glorified? seen for who I really am, with the glory that I had before the earth began. And so Jesus is so, so glorified. And we, as we celebrate um, the Lord's Supper, as we, we drink of the cup, I remember the blood of Jesus which was shed on, on our behalf. And remember that that deals with your past and, and all of your sins And his body, the bread, was broken for us. And as his body is broken for us, as he was crucified, you could think of it this way, that 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 deals with with our future. That deals with the problem of sin reigning in our life anymore. It's broken. It no longer has a hold on you anymore. We are cleansed from all that unrighteousness. And and now with the righteousness of Christ we're able to be free and to step forward to be all that in him we already are. And so we celebrate this meal together, and, and um, I think all of you know we'll, we'll get a couple of people to, to stand in different places around the room. The band will play, and please take your time. Make your way to take the bread and take the cup. Um, as you eat the bread, um, remember... Christ's body, which was broken for you. Keep the cup and we'll, we'll drink together in, in just a little while to express the unity that we have in, in Christ Jesus. Let's pray.
Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we want to thank you again for the precious gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you that he followed you into the River Jordan and, and was obedient to all that you asked of him. We thank you that he did indeed, not just symbolically, but in reality, die for our, our sin, taking upon himself the sin that separated us from you. As he walked into the Jordan, he could rightly declare that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All that you promise in terms of salvation is ours through Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. We want to thank you for your blood which was shed on the cross, for its ability to cleanse And restore right relationship with you. And as we take these two elements, Father, would, would the power and the significance of all that you have done to bring us in right relationship with you be evident to us once more. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 